All right, everyone. Good morning. The fact that you're back in class means that hopefully you somehow survived your Labor Day weekend. So congratulations on doing that successfully. Let's take a look and see whatever we shall be dealing with today. All right. Hey, so we're on lesson number five. We've already made it that far. That's pretty good stuff there. What are we going to be doing today? Well, we're going to be dealing with the if statement. And we're going to be talking about relational operators, which is good because they generally travel in uh, company with the if statement. So let's see what we got on the plate for today, shall we? Oh, hey, that's right. So there's a brand new person in your life, Pavan, OK? He's your new student, student learning instructor, OK? Pavan has one goal in life, to make sure that you turn in all of your programming assignments both your ICPAs and your homeworks, okay? Here's the trick. Pavan's not going to get paid until each assignment gets fully turned in. And what that means is Pavan's highly motivated to make sure that everybody turns in each one of your assignments, okay? So he's there for you. No matter how upset you are, no how much, how angry, how confused, how lost, no matter where you are in regards to any one of these assignments, Pavan's there for you. Hey, the TA's there for you also, and I'm there for you also. But Pavan arguably has the highest motivation to make sure that you turn in each one of your assignments in this particular class. Okay? He's not going to let up until you turn that assignment in, okay? Pavan's a really, really nice guy, but when it comes to turning your homework in in CGS 2060, you can view him as being sort of like a really, really large pit bull, all right? He's gonna be finding you. He's there to help you while you're working on it. No problems whatsoever. But dear God in heaven, if you don't turn it in, he's gonna be on you like white on rice, guys, okay? He's going to help you. He's going to make sure that you're successful. He's committed, primarily, because he wants to get paid. All right, so what else is going on? Oh, yeah, hey, by the way, no, by the way, it's not a new TA. It's a student services person. Uh, what is it? Let me get that right. I want to make sure I get my titles right here. It's student learning assistant, I believe, is the power phrase that they use, okay? Cool. Another thing for you to know about, USF Career Services. So Career Services is a service that the university provides to you. Hey man, I love going to university as much as anybody, but let us have a brief reminder here that going to university does not last forever, okay? Eventually you're gonna be done with this. And the question is, is what are you gonna do when you're done? Well, <laughs> go get a job probably, right? Well, fantastic. And whoever taught you how to get a job? Well, probably nobody, right? So do you currently have a resume? Oh, if you don't, then you need to go talk to your career services, okay? If you do have a resume, is it a good resume? Oh, I, I have no idea if it's a good resume. Cool, you should go talk to career services. Look, the guys in career services, this every day, all day long. They help people just like you basically get your act together. Make sure you have a good resume. Make sure you have a good cover letter. Oh yeah, one of those things too. But they can also hook you up with job opportunities, okay? Look, this is their job. They do it all the time. You're paying for them. <laughs> Thank you very much, okay? It's a resource you need to tap into, okay? Now, obviously, COVID-19 has got them shut down just like everybody else, but that's no big deal whatsoever. They'll still do, still do virtual appointments with you, okay? I got you their phone number on the bottom of the slide. I also have their website on the bottom of the slide, you need to reach out. And I don't care where you are in school, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, doesn't matter. You need to make sure you got a working resume in your back pocket. So someday when somebody says, hey, do you have a resume? You can whip it out, make sure you're taken care of no matter where you're at in school. And oh, by the way, you're taking my Python class, right? That's at least one more thing you can add to your resume. I know Python, right? What the heck? I don't care what you're going to be eventually in life. That's one thing that's going to make you stand out. OK, USF Career Services, give them a call, set up a chance to talk with them and let them point you in the right direction for what you're going to do after you get done with USF. It's your service. Use them. All right, cool. We're good with that. Oh, important dates. Hey, I got this email that told me about some important dates. So let me pass the important dates on to you. 
FYI, okay? Uh, way back on September 4th, your late payments were due. Thank you very much. Yesterday, the 8th, if you hadn't paid for fall, they dropped you. Damn it, I hate it when that happens. Good news though, 8th through the 11th, all you gotta do is show up with the check and all is forgiven. Fantastic, and pro no problems whatsoever. If you don't pay in that period, then the 14th through the 18th, you can get reinstated with what? A faculty written permission? Yo, anybody need that? Come to me, I'll give it to you. It's not a big deal whatsoever, okay? After the 18th, it turns out it's pretty much like an act of God <laughs> to get you back in for fall semester, but not a problem. We can do that too, okay? If you've got any of those fancy things like a tuition deferment or veterans deferment or any of that sort of stuff like that, don't sweat it. They're not gonna drop you, okay? Everything's cool. I think you still have to pay, but they're not gonna drop you, right? If you need a form to get all this sort of stuff taken care of, the uh, link is on the bottom of this particular slide and you'll get the slide when I distribute the notes for class, okay? Whole bunch of important dates. If you care, here are the dates that you need to know about. So congratulations, you've been getting some ICPAs, in-class programming assignments. You've been working on it, you've been turning them in, and I appreciate very much that you've been doing that. Now, let's have a talk about some of the most recent ICPAs that you've been turning in, and perhaps, shall we say, a miscommunication between us that we should resolve now before you start working on any homeworks. So let's talk about how not to do an ICPA. Upper left hand corner, what was this? This was, uh, oh, it was the UPC one. Remember, so what did I do? I gave you a UPC barcode. You had to break it up into piece parts. No problems with that whatsoever. Then I gave you, what was it? Something that had a cost. I said I wanted 12 of them and I wanted you to print out in a fancy format how much I was gonna cost me to get 12 of those items. Ah, not that hard to do, right? Well, everyone did pretty good job on the UPC one. So congratulations on that. It's when we're printing out the, how much the unit cost was, where things went, shall we say, a little awry. Upper left-hand corner, print, quantity, squiggle zero, fabulous. Unit, squiggle one, no problems whatsoever. Total, squiggle two, good job, not a problem. Dot format, 12, 275.15. Okay, I'm cool with that because I gave you those numbers. 3,301.80. cents. Stop. What'd you do? You calculated how much it was and you just put the value in there? No, we're using the computer here. So I told you that it was, uh, what was it? It was $275.15 per item. There was 12 items. Cool. Do some math in the computer program, figure out what it is, and then print it. Don't just be calculating the number and putting it in by hand. All right, let's take a look at our second example here. So once again, the uh, UPC stuff was all fine. Well, we got cost of items. Cost per unit is 275.15. Unit count is 12. We're doing well. We're doing really well here. T cost total is cost per unit time times unit count. Good, good. Now we've calculated. So we, we got all three values. So let's see, print part one equals zero. Part two equals uh, 20,357. And part three equals 12,268 and part four equals two. And the total of cost of the items is cost total. <laughs> All right, not quite sure what the hey, hey happened there. We did a good job in printing cost total, congratulations. We didn't print it formatted the way we wanted to. Remember we wanted to put commas in there and we wanted to restrict the number of uh, digits to the right of the decimal point to two and we didn't do that. So that's a bit of a problem. And I'm not sure what that part one, part two, part three, part four thing is all about, but that was really strange, so no. All right, and our final example here, lower right-hand corner. Um, this individual did it all in um, idle. So they just typed in the individual lines in idle. And arguably, idle is cool. Idle will handle it, no problems whatsoever, okay? The problem there is, I really sort of want you to do it as a program. So remember, in idle, you go up to file, you select new, brings up that blank sheet, you type in all your commands, and you click uh, run, and you say like PF5, run, you save it, and then it runs. So you're running a program. That's probably a little bit better. And the reason that's better is because when you're doing your homework, that's the way you're gonna wanna do your homework. You're not gonna wanna type each line of your homework into idle, okay? But anyway, let's get over that. So we go down to the very last line that they have here. Print quantity equals 12, 
Unit cost equals $200, dollar sign 275.15. Total cost equals dollar sign 3000, comma, 301, decimal point 80. Okay, so once again, they hard coded the answer. Stop! That's not the way you're supposed to do it. It's supposed to be 12 times 275.15, and then you were supposed to print it out so that it would format all nicely, right? So that just makes me sad. So stop with the hard coding. You got the computer here. Use the computer to do your calculations for you. So how should this have been done? That's an excellent question. Let's take a look. So here's the UPC code problem. The first part, of course, is the UPC code. I got the UPC code. I pick it apart into the different digits, which you all seem to have done a very good job of. Congratulations. We won't spend any time on that. Then we go down to unit cost is 275.15, then quantity, is 12 cool no problems i print a blank line woohoo then i do print unit cost colon is squiggle zero colon point two f so i'm going to print a floating point number and i would like to have two digits after the decimal point quantity squiggle one colon d i would like to print a decimal number Okay, cool, no problems whatsoever. And then I do purchase price colon squiggle two colon comma. I would like to have commas separating every three digits. Period two, I'd like to have two digits after the um, decimal point, and it's a floating point number. That's what the F is for, chink. And then I do format, unit cost, quantity, unit cost times quantity, bink and I get everything beautifully and wonderfully printed out for me automatically. I have the computer do all the work. I don't have to do any hand calculations and type in any values. So that's the right way to do the ICPA. So going forward, y'all, don't do your hand calculations and then work it into the program. That's not what we're trying to do here. Use the computer to do the calculations and then print out the results of those calculations. All right. Today's problem, the Python ATM machine, woohoo. So I want you to create a software that will provide an ATM user with a proper change amount for any dollar amount up to $200. And then I'm gonna want you to run the code for $19. So what would that be, $19? So if I was at an ATM machine, it would give me a 10, a five, and then like four ones, okay? $55, that would be two twenties, a 10 and a five, and 200, which is just a whole bunch of 20s. Ching, 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 ching. Okay, cool. All right, so that doesn't seem too bad. I don't think we have all the code we need to do that, but perhaps, maybe, fingers crossed, during class today, we'll pick up the extra things we need to be able to build our Python ATM machine. All right, so let's talk about making decisions. And arguably, decisions are one of the key things that computers do, okay? Um, basically, they have the ability to make decisions, okay? Here's a quick example for you. You make decisions all the time. So you're in a car, you're driving along, you come to a stoplight. What are you gonna do at the stoplight? Well, it depends on the color of the light, right? So if it's green, you'll go. If it's yellow, you'll go really fast. No, stop. If it's yellow, you'll slow down. And if it's red, you'll stop, All right? So basically, based on what that traffic light's telling you, you'll make a decision. A program can take different actions depending on inputs and other things that are going on. Well, that's cool. All of a sudden, we're starting to get into that like computer stuff where it's making decisions. Hmm, let's see how that goes. Okay, the way we do this is we use the if statement. In Python, if statements used to implement, surprise, surprise, a decision, okay? When a condition is fulfilled or true, one set of statements is gonna be executed. If a statement is not true, you have the option, if you so choose, to have a different set of statements happen. So one set if it's true, and another set if it's false. Okay, well that's sort of cool. So. Here's an example of using an if statement, and we're gonna create like a, a temperature control system for a room. All right, so the question is, is the room too cold? Yeah, it's way too cold, not a problem. Then we're gonna set the room temperature to 85 degrees. So question, is the room too cold? No, it's, it's fine, no problems. Then set the room temperature to 72 degrees. All right, so we got like an if statement there. Do this if it's too cold, or do this if it's not too cold.
what does the if statement look like in the fabulous language of Python? Well, here's what it looks like. So if we're making like an elevator control system, we would say if floor is greater than 13, colon, and the colon is important because it doesn't work if you don't do it. We'd say actual floor equals floor minus one. Notice that actual floor is indented under the if statement. That's important. All the indented lines will be run, okay? Then we have else colon actual floor equals floor. So if floor is greater than 13, then we will do actual floor equals floor minus one. So that code will be run if the condition floor greater than 13 is true. If floor is not greater than 13, then the else statement gets executed and actual floor equals floor then gets executed. So we've got, if it's true, we'll do actual floor equals floor minus one. And if it's false, we'll do actual floor equals floor. So once again, in Python, the if statement allows us to select between the two of those. What would this look like in Python? Well, here we go. So I have a variable called thermostat temperature. Chink, chink. I'm going to set it equal to zero. I'm going to say if the measured temperature, we'll say what comes from someplace, is less than 70 colon, then what I want to do is take thermostat temperature and set it to 85. Now, if that's not true, so if measured temperature is equal to or greater than 70, then else colon, I'm going to set the thermostat temperature to 78. Chink, chink, and we're good to go. Oh, we can do a compound if statement. So let's talk about this for a moment. Thermostat temperature equals zero. No problems. If outside temperature is less than 70 colon, then I'm going to do four separate things. First thing I'm going to do is set thermostat temperature to 85. Then I'm going to set fireplace to one. I'm going to set hot chocolate to one. And then I'm going to print out this, the expression, the room will be heated. OK, so that's a statement block. And those four statements will all be executed if outside temperature is less than 70. And I know that those four statements are going to be executed because they've all been indented underneath the if statement. Now I come to the else statement, which has not been indented. And it has a colon that comes after it. And if outside temperature is equal to 70 or greater than 70, aha, then I'll set thermostat temperature to 78 and I will print the room will be cooled. Once again, that's another statement block, two statements in this statement block, and they have both been indented under else. So it, with an if statement, you, if it's true, you can execute as many statements as you want, but you have to indent all of them. Same thing for the part that's negative, the else. If it's not true, you can execute as many statements as you want, but once again, they all have to be indented. And that's what we're going to talk about, tabs. All right, so Python requires what's called block structured code as part of its syntax. The alignment of statements within a Python program specifies which statements are part of which block. How do you move your cursor to the leftmost column? <laughs> How do you move over to do an indent? Uh, you can hit the space bar a bunch of times and make it happen, OK? A little bit easier way to do it, just hit the tab key. And in um, idle and in um, PyCharm, just hitting tab key, we'll just move it over. You can get everything to line up real nice, real easy. Block structure code has the property that nested statements are indented by one or more levels. So here we go. We've got a little piece of code. If total sales is greater than 100.0, then do three things. Discount equals this, total sales equals this, and print you received a discount. Now, if total sales is not greater than, if it's equal to or less than 100, then the difference is going to be equal to that. If the difference is less than 10, print, print purchase our item of the day, dun -dun, else print you need to spend blank more to receive a 5% discount. All right. So all that tabbing is showing you what belongs to what. So let's do a sample if problem. All right. So what do we got going on here? So we got the variables fuel amount and fuel capacity. 
hold the actual amount of fuel and the size of the fuel tank of a vehicle. Okay, cool. If less than 10% is remaining in the tank, a status light should show a red color. Otherwise, it shows a green color. Simulate this process by printing out either red or green. Okay, I think I can do that. Dun, 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 here we go. All right. So let's see what we're going to do here. Ding, 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 ding. So what are my variables? I have fuel amount and fuel capacity. Okay. We'll say that the tank can hold 100 gallons. We'll say right now we have 50 gallons in it. Cool. And what do I want to do? If less than 10% is remaining in the tank, a status light should show a red color. Okay, so I guess I get, so if 10%, uh, so uh, it's fuel capacity. Divided by fuel amount. Well, how about if we do our spelling correctly, sorry. Is less than 0 0.1 colon. What do we want to do here? The status if if less than 10% is remaining in the tank, it should show a red color. So then we say print red. Go. Else colon print. All right, so let's see what we got going on here. So we have a program, fabulous. It has two variables, fuel amount, which we've set to 100, and fuel capacity, which we've sent to 50. You know what? I got that backwards, didn't I? So fuel amount, which would be the amount in it, would be 50. Capacity would be 100. Oh, man, and I got this completely wrong, didn't I? It would be fuel amount. Divide by fuel capacity. Oh man, I just got to be. All right, so let's try this again. So we have fuel amount, which is how many, how much fuel is in the tank, which is 50 gallons. Oh my God. Fuel capacity, which is 100. Okay, got no problems with that whatsoever. Then we do a little bit of math. If fuel amount, 50, divided by fuel capacity, 100, okay, is less than 10% remaining, then we will print out red. Otherwise, we will print out green. Well, 50% is greater than 10%, so when we run it, we would assume that it will print out green, but let's find out. Mm, uh, I think I'm missing parentheses. How about that? All right, let's try it again. Hmm, I'm doing something else. Oh. All right, we just, once again, we had way too many parentheses going on there. All right, let's go. Man, okay, so it's being mean here. So let's say one, two, one. Oh, what happened is this is now an extra. There we go. Man, that was a lot of parentheses problems on my part. Sorry about that. Woo, look, it printed out green. All right, well, that's cool. All right, so now if we change our fuel amount to five gallons, five gallons should mean that there's less than 10% fuel remained in it. So that should change that if statement, right? So fuel amount divided by fuel capacity should now be less than 10%. It'll be 5%, so it should print out red. So let's give it a shot and see how that works. Woo, woo. All right, cool. All right, so our little program seems to have worked just fine. Yay, that is wonderful. We're good. All right. So it looks like that if statement, along with its matching pal, the else statement, seems to work. All right, we're cool with that. Now, let's talk about some coding best practices here. Okay, so let's see. If you want to uh, duplicate code, is sort of a big issue when you're writing a program. OK, so let's take a look at an example of what we got going on here. If measured temperature is less than 70, then thermostat temperature equals 85 
and we print out your new room temperature is thermostat temperature. Cool. Now, if measured temperature is equal to or greater than 70, then we'll execute the else block. And we'll do thermostat temperature equals 78. And we'll say print new room temperature, thermostat temperature. OK. And that's perfectly valid Python code. It will run just fine. But the problem we have with this, if we decide that after we set the temperature, if we want to change the phrase that we print out to be like, your room temperature will be, instead of new room temperature, we're going to have to go into our program and we're going to have to make two changes. OK, and that's unnecessary. And the reason is, is because we've basically duplicated code. We could do this differently to make our life easier. And the way we could do it differently would be something like this. If measured temperature is less than 70, then thermostat temperature is equal to 85 else thermostat temperature is equal to 78 and then we print out new room temperature blah 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 right so what was two lines of code is now just one line of code and if we had to change new room temperature to your room will now be at blah 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 we'd only have to change one line i mean admittedly this is a simple example okay it's designed to be a simple example but hopefully you get the gist of it if it's possible to not duplicate code you don't want to primarily because it makes your life easier if you ever have to go back and change that code you only have to make your changes in one place as opposed to maybe searching all of your code to figure all the places all the different places where you have exactly the same code that has to be changed so there we go good life lesson so let's talk about the python python comparison operators and these are the ones that we use in the if statement right so right off the bat, of course, we've got the greater than. Cool, we're good with that. We have greater than or equal to. OK, we're cool with that. Less than, less than or equal to. No problems whatsoever. Ah, and this is where things get tricky. If we want to check to see if two things are equal, we use equal, equal. We don't use a single equal because that's assignment. But equal, equal is a comparison between two items. Then we also have two things not equal to each other, and that's exclamation equals, says that things are not equal to each other, okay? Not that it matters that much, but relational operators have a lower precedence than arithmetic operators, which means if you're comparing two things that have some math involved in them, the math stuff's gonna get worked out first, and then after all the math is done, then the comparison will occur. Okay, just something important to keep in mind, just in case you get surprised about the way a comparison is actually working out. So let's just take a few examples of what comparisons look like. So we've got three is less than or equal to four. Not a problem whatsoever. That's perfectly good, and it turns out it's true. Three is less than four. Three equal to or less than four. Er, in Python, that's illegal. Python has no idea what equal less than is it has to be less than or equal okay three greater than four that's false okay four less than four false again four less than or equal to four now that's true okay three is equal to five minus two turns out that's true okay three is not equal to five minus one five minus one is four three is not equal to four that is true yes Three is equal to six divided by two? And the answer is no, because that's assignment. You're trying to assign six divided by two, which is three, to the variable called three. <laughs> and there is no variable called three. 1.0 divided by 3.0 equals 0 0.33333. The problem is, is you can never exactly match 0.3 into infinity, so that'll never be true. And then double quote, 10 double quote, is greater than five. Uh, no, because double quote 10 double quote is a string. It's not the number 10. It's a string with the character one and zero, which has nothing to do with a number. So you can't possibly be greater than five. All right, so let's see how Python logical operators work. OK, so we've got and 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 will return true if both of the statements are true. And an example is is X less than five? and is x less than 10, which basically means that x is, 
basically less than five is what that means. All right. Or returns true if one of the statements is true. Is X less than five or is X less than four? Either one of those can be true. And if either one of them is true, then the or will turn out to be true. And then, of course, not basically reverses the result. Returns false if the result is true. So if we say is X less than five and X less than 10. And that's going to come back to be either true or false. And since we have a not there, it will convert the true to false and the false to true. So I got three pieces of code on the bottom down here. So let's take a look. If age is greater than 21 and ID equals one, and both of those have to be true, then you get your beer. Woohoo! If, if your age is not greater than 21 or you don't have your ID, then you're not going to buy any beer. Sorry. Okay. Center section here. If hungry equals one or bored equals one, you're going to be eating. So you will eat if you're hungry or if you're bored. Okay. Now, interestingly enough, you'll also eat if you are hungry and bored. All you need is one of those conditions to be true. They don't both have to be true, but if one of them is, you're good to go. Now, the else there is go running, <laughs> and you will go running if you're not hungry and you're not bored. Okay, that's cool. And the final example is if not age greater than 65, then Social Security equals zero. So if you are over 65, yay, okay, so that would be true, then the not will turn that true into a false, poof, and you will not set Social Security equal to zero. But if you are younger than 65, then age greater than 65 will be false, not will turn that false into a true, and so if you're under 65, Social Security will be set to zero. All right. Hey, look, it's the word of the day. So remember how this works. It's a word of the day. And so that means that it's your responsibility to send an email to the TA. And that email needs to have a subject line that has today's word of the day, which coincidentally happens to be SOFA. OK, send it to the TA. Make sure that you do that and let the TA know that you were in class today. You do that, and we'll all be taken care of. That'll be fantastic. You'll be happy. The TA will be happy. I'll be happy. Man, what more could you actually ask for? Nothing, I would say. Nothing at all. All right. Hey, it's another sample programming assignment. Fantastic and wonderful. So what do we want to do here? We want to write a program that's going to ask the user to enter two integers. OK, it'll obtain the number from the user and then it's going to print the larger number followed by the words is larger. Now, if the numbers are equal, print the message. These numbers are equal. Does not seem like rocket science, so I think we can probably do this. Right. That's good code. I'm very happy with that code. I'll go ahead and stow that code over here. Come on. There we go. Thank you. Fabulous. All right. So, so I got to ask the user for two values. Okay. So, uh, input equals integer. Uh, no, I did that wrong, right? Value. 1 equals integer input enter the first value. That's so good. I will copy it and use it for the second one. Do. I got my two values. Now what do I got? What do I got to do with this? Ching, ching. Here we go. Write a program that asks the user to enter two integers. Got that. Obtains the number from the user and then prints the larger number followed by the words is larger. The numbers are equal. Print the message. These numbers are equal. OK. So if value one equal equal value two, so if they're equal, colon, print, the numbers are 
equal. Else, if value one, ooh, value one is greater than value two, colon, print value, actually, value one, comma, is greater than value two. Else, I guess it would be less than, right? So let's take a look at our program here. So we've got our greater than program. I have a variable called value one. I'm going to do an integer because remember, all inputs come in as a string. So I'll say enter the first value. User will type in the first value. I'll turn it into an integer and I'll store it in value one. Same thing for value two. The user will enter the second value as a string. I'll turn it into an integer and I'll store it in value two. Fantastic. Now I start things off by saying if value one equals value two, then print the numbers are equal. Poof, and I'm done. Okay. Now, if it turns out that value one is not equal to value two, I will now go to my else statement, which desperately needs to have a colon at the end of it. Thank you very much. And I will say if value one is greater than value two, then I'm going to print value one is greater than value two. Cool. Now, if that's not true, I will go to the else statement and I will do print value one is less than value two. Ching, ching, and I'm done. All right. No problems whatsoever. Let's give it a run and see how it goes. Enter the first value. So I'll put in what, 10? Enter the second value. I'll say 20. 10 is less than 20. All right. That worked out pretty well. Let's run it again. I wonder if we uh, make them equal. Let's give that a try. Ten. Ten. Come on, baby. Whoop. Numbers are equal. All right. One more scenario, right? So let's run. Twenty for the first number. Ten for the second number. Twenty is greater than ten. Fabulous. All right. So I think we did it. Knock that one out of the park. So once again, note that we used the if statement. Obviously, it has a colon at the end of it. We used an else statement. has a colon on it. And we put another if else statement inside of that else statement with colons on both of those. So that worked out pretty well. All right. And now we're to your programming assignment. All right, well, let's think about this. So it's today's programming assignment. It's the Python ATM machine. OK, so what's your goal here? You want to create software that will provide an ATM user with the proper change for any dollar amount up to 200. OK, well, that's cool. So we want to run the code for 1955 and 200. And we can do that pretty easily, I think. All right, so let's go here. That's no, not that. Lovely code, if I do say so myself. We'll just take and stow it off. I'm sure we can use it later on for something. Chink. So we will ATM machine. Mm. All right. So how do we? Do, I guess we got to ask the user for how much they want. So DRA withdrawal. Hopefully that's spelled right. Whatever. Integer. Input, enter the amount to withdraw. I'm trying to do enter correctly. How about that? All right. Now, 
I have my money or I know how much they want to get and it's in the variable called withdraw. Cool. Not a problem whatsoever. So what are you, so I can go up to 200, I think, right? Let's just double check that. Chink. And for any dollar amount up to 200. So let's see how this would actually work. OK, so if withdraw. is greater than $100, print the dollar bill. OK. Oh, and then I got to do with draw equals with draw minus 100. Because I just withdrew 100. All right, I got 100 taken care of, right? So what's the next thing I have to do? So if it was like 200, it's down down to like 100, right? So if withdraw is greater than 100, colon, basically it's exactly the same thing. So let's try that. All right. So it's not a very sophisticated ATM machine at this point in time because I can really only handle 200 because <laughs> it only gives out $100 bills. Woohoo, my favorite ATM machine. But let's give it a run and let's see what happens here, okay? So run, run, yeah. Enter the amount to withdraw. I would like to get $200. OK, so I got my 100, but it looks like I got a spelling all error. Oh, that's what it is. All right, so we'll run it again. Not a problem. All right, $200, thank you very much. Well, you know, I'm pleased and happy to have a hundred dollar bill, so let's not walk away from that. But I asked the ATM machine for two hundred dollars and it gave me one hundred dollars. And the question is why? Well, interesting question. So let's take a peek here. So let's see what's going on here. So withdrawal is going to be equal to two hundred. So I will say if two hundred is greater than one hundred, then print one hundred dollar bill. That seems to be happening. Then I will say withdrawal is equal to 200 minus 100, which means I will store 100 in withdrawal. And I will say if withdrawal, which is 100, is greater than 100. Well, 100 will not be greater than 100, and yet I still want to get that second hundred dollar bill. So it seems like maybe this 100 should be changed. What do you think? Greater than 99? All right, let's give it a shot and see how it works now. I would like to get $200 out of your ATM machine. Bam, bam. And it gives me two $100 bills, which is correct. Woohoo! All right, fabulous. So I'm not saying that's the complete program because it's not, but it seems like a fine start to the ATM program. And I will be very excited to see how you complete it as part of your in class programming assignment for today. Fantastic. So you're on the hook to write using Python to create an ATM machine that the person can type in any number, whole number, because we don't give out change, <laughs> any whole number up to $200 and have the machine give out the proper amount of change using US currency, okay? And by the way, somebody had mentioned to me the other day, I think there is a $50 bill. I don't think I've ever seen a $50 bill, but I think we got $100 bill, $50 bill, 25, and one, I think, is what you have to work with when you're putting your ATM machine together. All right. Oh, an algorithm. Well, that sounds like a good thing. I apologize. I should have gone here. So when you're creating your version of the ATM machine, you probably want to implement the ATM machine algorithm. Let's see what it looks like. Is the amount greater than $100? Then provide a $100 bill and subtract $100. We did that. Okay, that's cool. Oh, is the amount still 
greater than 100. And you know, that's wrong. It should be greater than 99. We're smarter than that. Then provide another $100 bill and subtract 100. Is the amount greater than $20? Then provide a $20 bill and subtract 20. Is the amount greater than $10? Then provide a $10 bill and subtract 20. Is the amount greater than $5? Provide a $5 bill and subtract 5 and provide the main, remaining amount in single $1 bills. Now that's good, but it's not really quite accurate. So here on, two seconds here, chink. So we know that this is wrong, so that should be 99. This we should say, so if it was like $99, we'd want to repeat this, but three times. I guess it's really sort of maybe. And let's see, 10. So it'd be under 20 that you would actually do a 10. How many times would you, how many 10s would you give out? Would you just give out one 10? Because if it was, if I wanted to get $20, you give me a $20 bill. If I wanted to get $19, I guess it'll just be one $10 bill. Okay, so, and I guess five won't come into play until after you're under 10. So yeah, okay, so I think 10s and ones, you're only ever gonna get like one of those. So I think that's cool. All right, I can go with that. Ching, 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 ching. All right, so there's your basic algorithm for the program. You're gonna have to play with it a little bit, make sure that it's correct. But I think we're, I think we're pretty close to where we need to be on that one. All right, all right. What's in your Python toolbox now? Well, we've got the print statement, we've got math, strings, we can do input and output, and today we added if and else statements. Man, that toolbox is starting to get sort of full at this point in time. Not bad, not bad. So what did we go over today? We went over the if and else statement, and we talked about all the different relational operators that you can use with if and else. Greater than, less than, equal to, not, equal to, et cetera, et cetera. So we got all of those that we can use every time we create an if and an else statement. What shall we cover next time? Well, we're gonna cover the for loop, which is a really powerful command that allows us to do things over and over and over and over again. So that'll be pretty cool. There's a lot of baggage that comes along with that. So we got a bunch of things that we wanna talk about next time, but we're in a really good place to have that discussion come next Monday. All right, well, fantastic. That's exactly the material that I wanted to cover today. So I'm really pleased that we had a chance to do it. So that's all good stuff. So my question to you, of course, is, do you have any questions for me? Okay, so I have a question in the chat. What does it mean by proper change if you only take out whole numbers? Is that just asking what your account balance will be at the end? Say you take out $180, the change will be 20. Well, I think we're a little confused here. So I'm gonna walk up, it's like you've used ATM machines before, right? I'm gonna walk up to the ATM machine. Let us assume, and perhaps it's a big assumption, that you have enough money in your account. Okay, so we'll get that assumption. And you wanna withdraw anywhere from one to $200, okay? And it's whole numbers. You don't wanna get a dollar seventy-five. <laughs> you just wanna get from one to 200 in whole numbers, you'd like to withdraw. Okay, there is a question as to whether or not a for loop would be appropriate to use here. Yes, it would make things a lot easier and you wouldn't have to repeat code, but we haven't gone over the for loop, so you can't use it. You can only use the statements that we've covered in class so far. Okay, da, 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 da. I think we have most of the chat questions answered. Does anybody have a question for me before we break for the week? Going once, going I twice. Question. Oh, I love questions. What's your question? Oh, these are due Friday night, right? No, actually, I think they're due just before our next class. So arguably, they're due on Monday uh, at 11 o'clock. OK, thank oh. you. All right, no problems. Good question. Thank you very much for asking. Does anybody else have a question for me? Um, I do. I know this was asked, I think, a little bit earlier in the chat when you were running the code for the first part of the in-class dissertation assignment. 
they're asking, could we use the greater than or equal to symbol for the second $100? All right, well, you bring up an interesting question. I'll tell you, what, let's go take a quick peek at it real fast here, okay? One moment. Do, 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 boom, boom. All right, so here's the code, right? So what was your question about this code? Um, for the second part, because now the balance would the withdrawal amount would be 100. Someone asked, could you use the greater than or equal to 100 instead of making the number 99 and keeping the greater than symbol? I think that's an excellent question. I'll tell you what, let's run it and find out, shall we? All right, so you see how I've changed it. Withdrawal is now greater than or equal to 100. So it's a good question. So we'll know it's successful if I get $200 bills for entering 200, right? Bam, it looks like it worked perfectly. So your question, could I use, uh, what was it, greater than 99 or greater than or equal to 100? Is a great question and it turns out greater than or equal to 100 works perfectly and is exactly the same as greater than or equal to 99. So yeah, no, your point is very well made. That works perfectly with no problems whatsoever. All right, good questions all around guys, congratulations. Are there any more questions for me? Going uh, on. Oh, there's, go. Yeah, so there's one in the chat that I think um, I've been wondering for a little while. Um, is there any way for you to post like the specific assignment in the um, Canvas like assignment page rather than we have to go to the uh, slideshow to find out what we have to do specifically? That seems like a great deal of effort on my part, actually. But would that be an assistance to you? Personally, yes. Okay. I'm I'll not sure you, if it if it not a problem be applicable to everybody, but yeah. That's fine. Then here's what we'll do. Going forward, I will desperately try to remember to do that. Okay. And if I forget for whatever reason, slide me a note and remind me <laughs> that I forgot to do it. But starting today, I will try to post the ICPA text into uh, an assignment. Um, what I guess I you know what I guess I just put it into the assignment right I'll just put in the text block on the assignment is that correct yeah because right now the all of the ICPAs are just blank I got it. The, okay. yeah should not be a problem whatsoever I will desperately try to remember to do that and if I forget for whatever reason do me a favor just send me an email and remind me and I'll get it taken care of okay okay well do all right not a problem thank you very much for asking I appreciate it we should be good to go with that cool Excellent, guys. I think we're in a good place here. Does anybody else have a question for me? Going once, going twice. All right. I think we're. Oh, there's yeah. one that just pop, popped up in the chat. Uh, the homework assignment is to finish the ATM machine assignment due before class on Monday. Yes. So the ICPA number five, I guess, is what this really is, is to complete the ATM assignment and have it taken care of before class starts on Monday at 11 o'clock. Do we think that's a good answer? Is that a complete answer? Okay, cool, all right, seems like that took care of it. All right, hey, thank you very much for giving me the heads up on the chat questions, so thank you very much. All right, I think we're good to go. Going once, going twice. All right, fabulous guys, have a fabulous weekend. Everybody stay safe, wash your hands, wear your face mask, stay away from everybody, and I will see you back in class on Monday.